I don't even think that it's a word that I can describe on how I've been feeling for 25 years knowing that I've been incarcerated for something that I didn't do. I don't even, they don't even have a word in the dictionary. And I've been waking up like that since 1996. I think about it all day, every day. I'm 49 now. I'll be 50 December the 9th. So you have spent all of your young adult life into now in, in prison. Yeah you, can, yeah, you can basically say I grew up in prison. Brandon Jackson was convicted of armed robbery in 1997, a crime he says he didn't commit, and sentenced to life. The verdict in Brandon's case was not unanimous. Ten jurors voted guilty. Two jurors voted not guilty. In 48 out of 50 states, Brandon would have had the right to a retrial, but not in Louisiana. It's important to have a unanimous jury verdict because it is important to make sure that there are not reasonable doubts as to someone's guilt. So when one or two jurors say that they have a doubt about guilt, how you can continue to put someone in prison is, is beyond me. Brandon has been fighting to get out of prison for years. In 2020, there was hope when the Supreme Court ruled that these convictions were unconstitutional. But the court later said the ruling would not be retroactive, meaning Brandon wouldn't get a new trial. And you, you ruled that it was unconstitutional, but you still upheld it. You know why? We know why. Because it, 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 it affected more African-American males than it did any other race. Fault Lines partnered with The Lens, a nonprofit newsroom in New Orleans, to investigate the path forward for people locked up on non-unanimous convictions. Have you thought through what the day would be like, the day that you leave prison? The only thing that I look forward to and the only thing that would probably be on my mind is probably just to hug my mom. That's it. You know, just, just to hug my mom and just to, you know, hold her and just tell her, you know, I love her and just just hear what she has to say because I know she ain't gonna never stop crying. Happy Mother's Day. Here's your hard-headed son. You are my mother, father, family, and best friend. I'm praying that all will be fine when I go to court. So as you've always done, pray for my release. But remember, in his time, not ours. You have a special relationship with Brandon. Yes, because he was the one that needed me most. And I didn't love my other kids any less. But Brandon was always sickly. As a young child, Brandon had severe asthma and needed constant medical attention. So he spent his first 15 years in house on the breathing machine or else he was in a hospital. More than less, he was a sheltered kid. And when he turned 15 and was able to master his attacks, he tried to make up for the time that he had lost. And that's when he began to veer to the left, trying to fit in and get in. What has it been like for you as a mother to have him be put behind bars for so long? It's indescribable. You don't bring your child into the world to become a prisoner. And to me, uh, in the state of Louisiana, being incarcerated is just another form of slavery. His sisters and brothers haven't visited him in 25 years. Nobody's visited him but me. And all my family has died. And so right now, all he has is me. 24 years after his conviction, Brandon is asking for a new trial based on the fact that the verdict in his case was non-unanimous. Bless the people, families that are with us today and is trying to help us in all the way. These and other blessings I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's roll.
It's July, and there's a hearing at the courthouse in Bossier Parish in northwest Louisiana. Brandon's fate is in the hands of a judge in this conservative part of the state. The district attorney, or DA here, has opposed Brandon's effort to get out. How many hearings have you been? Oh, too many to count. And how are you feeling about the hearing that we're going to today? I just pray for a positive outcome because my hopes have been dashed so many times going to this courthouse. How Brandon ended up with a life sentence for a crime in which no one was hurt is as much a story about the harsh laws passed in the 1990s during the so-called War on Drugs. The prosecutor seized on three previous drug convictions to give Brandon life. In 2019, his sentence was reduced to 40 years. That made him eligible for parole for the first time, but his application was denied. His mother was devastated. And I had the heart attack two months later because I don't react. I swallow stress and I just hold it and hold it and hold it. So it just took a toll on my body. You thought that the heart attack was because of what happened to Brandon? The yeah, Brandon? It, it, it wasn't the cause, but it helped. You know, your heart can take so much. Brandon Jackson's trial was here at the Bossier Parish Courthouse. He was accused of robbing an Applebee's restaurant at gunpoint. There was no physical evidence that connected him to the crime, but the state had a star witness. Tell me, who is Joseph Young? Uh, Joseph Young was my brother-in-law. He was uh, dating my sister at the time. Joseph Young worked at the Applebee's. He initially denied any involvement in the robbery, but later changed his story and told police he planned it with Brandon. He said he opened up the back door and let two armed men walk in. They tied up the staff and stole more than $6,000. Nobody was injured. Young testified that Brandon was one of the two gunmen and paid him $1,000 to participate. Did you commit the robbery? No. And the evidence showed that none of the descriptions of the individuals looked like me, uh, was built like me, and all that was brought up. The biggest thing to me is that no physical evidence was found on Brandon Jackson's person. No physical evidence was found in his home. All the evidence. Of so no the, fingerprints on the guns or the money. They right. didn't have. They None couldn't link any of that to Brandon Jackson's fingerprints. Correct. And so, like, all they have is the testimony of of Joseph Young. We obtained and reviewed the transcripts of Brandon's trial. So right here, the prosecutor is questioning Joseph Young, and he asks him. So you would hope that this helps you with your sentence. Is that correct? In other words you're testifying against your friend to reduce your sentence. And clear as day, Joseph Young says, yes, sir. Joseph Young served three months in jail and was placed on probation for his role in the robbery. We also obtained and digitized a videotape that hasn't been seen in 25 years. It's a statement Joseph Young gave to Brandon's lawyer at the time before the trial. He claimed that neither of the robbers looked like Brandon. You know Brandon Jackson, right? Yes. And you know how, how he's built? Yes. Neither of them fit his build? No, The judge didn't allow the jury to see this video, ruling that Joseph Young had made the statement in confidence to an attorney. He was the star witness. How common is it that the star witness would be changing his story? Uh, more common than you think, but it's still ultimately problematic. But I think even without that video being admitted to evidence, something in the way that the state presented the case convinced two jurors to vote not guilty. And so in most states, it would have been a mistrial. In Louisiana, though, it was, a, it was enough to convict him. What sticks out with Brandon's case is what sticks out with so many of the men and women's cases that we have with non-unanimous jury verdicts. And it's that there are serious doubts as to guilt, right? Um, the accuracy of these convictions are really in doubt. They involve uh, witnesses who get a benefit for testifying against another, as was the case 
in Brandon's, they involve long sentences. This is not what would happen elsewhere. Louisiana's laws are unduly harsh. The history of this harsh law in Louisiana dates back to the Jim Crow era. Following the Civil War, Black Americans began to exercise newfound civil rights, like access to the ballot box and serving on juries. White politicians responded with poll taxes and literacy tests, tools to disenfranchise Black voters. They also implemented non-unanimous jury convictions. There was uh, a constitutional convention, I think it was 1898, and uh, the goal, professed goal, it was said, it was in actually written down. Its purpose was to ensure the supremacy of the white race in perpetuity to the greatest extent permissible under federal law. And so that and was you know, why they how got How do you know it. that was the purpose? Yeah. Uh, that is what the official journal of the proceedings states. And one of the ways they thought they, they needed to uh, accomplish that mission was to marginalize some of the voices that might wind up on a jury. So as opposed to having all 12 people decide guilt or innocence, uh, after Reconstruction, it was possible that there could be some black folks who might get on a jury. Their intent was to convict more black people and to silence the voices of black jurors. In practice, they have convicted more black people and have disproportionately silenced black jurors. There are now more than 1,500 people in prison in Louisiana convicted by non-unanimous juries. 80% of those prisoners are black. We tried to contact all of the jurors in Brandon's case. Some have died, and some we spoke to didn't remember the trial very well. We did confirm that the two jurors who voted against convicting Brandon were black. One of the two was willing to speak with us, but she asked us not to reveal her name or show her face. What I mainly remember is that when they presented the case and when we deliberated, that I was not convinced that it was proven that he was guilty. And what, why were you having doubts about that? No one said that they knew it was Brandon, they recognized him, they knew his mannerisms. No one was able to say that he was enough to convince me that they were sure that it was him that committed the robbery. You, did you express your point of view to the jurors? I'm sure I at least made one statement and it was blown down. I mean, they dismissed it. And when they dismissed your concerns, how did that make you feel? I felt like, okay, I voiced my opinion. And I was hoping that maybe what I said had sank in on someone and made them think about it and could change their mind, even if they didn't want to speak out in front of the group. But uh, from the verdict, that did not happen. We tracked down one of the jurors who voted to convict Brandon. There was just a multitude of things that made me believe that he was guilty of this crime. Did you have any doubts in your mind about his guilt? No, I did not. I remember um, Brandon Jackson coming into the jury, into the courtroom, and he was very um, sure of himself. He seemed to have a very, um, he smiled a lot. He seemed very relaxed. But I remember Brandon made a lot of eye contact with the jurors, and he seemed to be pretty sure of himself. And like I said, I felt he was real, really overconfident. Um, so there was something this, about his demeanor. There was just something about his demeanor that it was like he was trying to win us over to his side with his smile, his, he made a lot of eye contact, I remember. Um, and um, so I think, I think that was, um, I remember that real strongly about him. And so it was a 10 to 2 conviction. Oh, was it 10 to 2? 10 to 2. Okay. And the two who did not agree mm -hmm. were African, were both African American. Oh, okay. We actually caught up with the one woman, she didn't think he was guilty, or she just wasn't convinced because she said that nobody had, nobody was able to identify him. Right, because they all had ski masks or they had bandanas on. Nobody was able to identify him mm -hmm. except for the co-conspirator. Mm -hmm. How does that make you feel about non-unanimous jury convictions? Do you, I mean, does that become problematic for you if there's one person or more than one person on the jury that doesn't feel like their voice is being heard, especially someone of color? Um, well, 
You know, I, I've, I've been raised, I've lived in the South my whole life. I was, you know, born here, raised here. Um, I don't believe that their voice was not heard. I mean, I, I, I don't think, I'm not sure that I, I don't even remember if she explained why she didn't think he was guilty. I don't, I don't even remember that. I don't think it's that their voice isn't heard. I just think that there were more people that thought he was guilty. One of the reasons why she thought, you know, that you were guilty was because you were looking at the jury and you were making eye contact with the jury. The only thing that I was doing at that time was what I was asked to do by my attorney. He said, always give the jury eye contact, you know? So if she based her decision on the way that I look, you know, what, 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 does, what does that say about the type of world that we live in, a look. Now you blow me with that one, that don't even sit well, you know. So you telling me if I would've never looked at you, if I would've just looked at the judge the whole time, I wouldn't be sitting right here because you would've found me not guilty. It's very, very telling. It, it really sort of speaks to the language uh, in that 1898 Constitutional Convention that created this law. A black male making eye contact with a white person uh, years ago could cause him to lose his life. And in this particular situation, it caused him to lose his freedom. And you were a little bit um, nervous about talking to us on camera. Why was that? I just wouldn't want just to get back to so my bosses because it could have a negative effect on me. Why is that? Because they think you're a lot of like the people on the jury do yet. Which is how? Um, he's a criminal. Let's get him off the street. Let's lock him up. He's a criminal. Let's lock him up. Or maybe even he is, he's a black man. Let's lock him up. You know, I'll never forget the expression on some of the jurors' face. Some of them was actually smiling before the verdict was handed down. But am I mad? Am I bitter? No. No, I, ain't, I ain't mad, I ain't bitter, because I'm gonna use what happened to me to actually try to change some of these laws. If Brandon hopes to change the laws, he will likely have to do it at the Louisiana State House in Baton Rouge. In April, Democratic state lawmakers proposed a bill that would revisit past convictions like Brandon's, but it was rejected by Republicans who said banning the practice moving forward was enough. I can't really look at it through that lens and say, I'm gonna look back and see what could have been done different. I'm only gonna look at what can be done forward and try and make change that way. If it was deemed unconstitutional, and we know that it's rooted in a racist origin, and there's, there's 1,500 people there that are sitting there, they sleep there at night, and a lot of them are in there for life. Don't they deserve their case to be looked at again? I feel pretty confident in my vote because the Supreme Court said that the way we did it was correct. How is it not unconstitutional for the people there who are there now? The Supreme Court said we were fine, so I can't argue with the well, What do you think? I think what we did was bold, monumental, and I'm happy that we got that push forward. Do you think that those people deserve a remedy? I think there is a remedy. What is the remedy? The remedy is the DA can review it. But if the DA decides not to review, then they then don't. Then they don't have a remedy. And how do you feel about that? Do you think that's right? I feel confident in what we did. But I, look, I don't look at it from a racial lens. What we did was not about race. It was about doing what was right. They did exactly what has been done so many times before. When we say we've fixed the law, we've called it a Jim Crow law, but we refuse to acknowledge that there are people who are carrying the weight of this and we refuse to take that weight off of their shoulders. There are no black Republicans here, right? So when they know that the, the people that this would benefit don't look like them, likely didn't grow up in their neighborhoods, likely don't know anyone that could contact them, they don't care about it. So um, you, you can't eliminate the, the racial element because I will guarantee you if 80% of the folks that we were talking about were white, the bill would have passed, period. If Brandon Jackson can't get help at the state legislature, his only hope is back in Bossier Parish. The district attorney here could agree to look at his case again, 
but very few DAs throughout the state have agreed to re-examine old cases. So we are back at the Bossier Courthouse. Um, we've been trying to get in touch with this DA multiple times, and he's not returning any of our messages. So we're going to see if he's here. Maybe we can find him here and ask him a few questions. Is he here today? No, ma'am, he did not come. He did not? OK. Nice house. Well, so he is out of town. I just spoke with his daughter. So she took down my name and number and said she would tell him to call me. Old case of a gentleman named Brandon Jackson. I don't know if you remember the details of that case. I'm not familiar with this particular case because I've only been to the DA 20 years. What period did this conviction arise out of? This was in Bossier. This was in Bossier, and it was in 1997. Okay. And you got to realize that the United States Supreme Court for 75 years told us this was okay. Non-unanimous jury verdicts were not part of the U.S. Constitution. And so now in 2020, they tell us it's not okay. We know that the origins of this law go back to, you know, Jim Crow times. And and in this case, these it, it, it worked exactly like it was intended to, 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 um, to mute the voices of these black jurors. Well, I, you know, again, I, I'm not disputing the origin of the law. I, I think all of that got a lot of traction with the legislature. And then, of course, Jim Crow, con, you know, connotes a, a horrible, horrible time in our history. I, I get all that. I do believe in our jury system. I think it's, for the most part, they generally get it right as far as what the facts are. I'm giving you details about this one particular case because this is the one that I've been looking at and that I'm interested in. Does this sound like the kind of case that you would be willing to go back and look at and retry? Sure, sure. I don't have a problem doing that. Who His name is Brandon Jackson. Name? Brandon Jackson. Brandon Jackson. Um, and if you could look into Brandon Jackson's case and give me a call back, I would really appreciate that. I'll call you by Wednesday. Thank you, sir. Have a great, All have right. a great weekend. Bye bye. You too. More than three weeks later, in a letter to Fault Lines, Bossier Parish District Attorney Skylar Marvin said, quote, my office will not vacate and retry convictions solely because of a non-unanimous verdict. Back at the Bossier Parish Courthouse, Brandon still has one last possible remedy. I've been up here so many times, I feel like I need to give me a hotel room. The judge in his case still needs to rule on his application for a retrial, but it's not going to happen today. Even though the state had months to prepare, the judge decided to give them even more time to respond. It's like we're in a holding pattern. Mm -hmm. They just don't want to turn him loose. And it looks like to me it's a good old boy, Nick Wood. So I know it's a waiting game. I don't have long. I, I say my heart surgery is only six months. And I'm trying to stay out there. It's God to allow me to live long enough to see him go free. But at this rate, I'm not going to make it. How does it make you feel to see that Confederate monument right outside of the courthouse in Bossier Parish? I think seeing the Confederate statue is like that constant reminder that the system was not built for, for black people. This same jury system was erected in the way that that statue was and in order to send a message to black defendants that this isn't the place for you. I was going to ask you one more question. Um, when you you said to me the other day that it was very important to you. You've made it to all of Brandon's hearings. Even if you have to drive however far, you go to everything. Why is it so important to you to be there for every single one? I never want Brandon to feel that he has been forgotten. I want him to know that he's worthy. No matter how long he's going to be in prison or whatever is going to happen, he will never be forgotten. His mama will never, ever forget him. Will you be able to get out in time to have that cup of coffee with her? You mean as far as her health? Yes. 
that's hard to say. That's 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 something only God knows. You know, she's done been through everything that it is to go through. You know, heart attacks, bad kidneys, cancer, COVID, and guess what? Every time I call, did she always say, tell him I ain't going nowhere until I see him come home. And that's why I fight every day, you know, and I'm gonna continue to fight until I get there with her because I know she need me. Thank you.